Uh, we'll start off with the typical disclaimers, opinions expressed here, commentary. Those are our own, not attributed to our employers, vendors, customers, or B-sides, SLC. We are more than willing to discuss any and pretty much everything we do. We, we are not willing to discuss who our customers are though, and who we do it for uh, beyond high-level stuff. We do urge caution when testing some of the stuff that we're talking about here. We're not going to give you like a how-to guide to go blow away a network, but uh, we do touch on some topics that if you're left to your own devices on your production network, all of your administrators and bosses will be quite upset. So we already covered who we are. Here's our Twitter handles and whatnot. Yeah. So my background is primary software development. I've been thrust into the cybersecurity world several years ago, so I kind of try to fuse the two. So let's do it next. Question is, why are we here? So we monitor, we're tasked with monitoring and providing intrusion de detection and analysis for a very large set of networks that are geographically distributed. Those networks are constantly under threat from your, all of your average run-of-the-mill uh, average hackers and nation-state actors. So we have to constantly evolve the tactics that our, our SOC analysts are using to uh, combat that and kind of give us visibility into that space. I'm sure you're all aware that there are constant announcements of new products on the market you know, they're all the latest, greatest thing. They're everything you want it to be. You know, they're basically Swiss Army knives. We used, to, we used to operate in a space where there were a handful of really good security products, and you just had all three of those, and you were good. But now you've got competition from a lot of different vectors. There's a lot of overlap. You don't want to deploy a lot of redundant capabilities uh, because it increases your administrative overhead. So... We spend a lot of time testing all of those products to kind of see how they fit into our problem space. Which ones do what they do, or what they claim to do, how well they do it, and how well they'll do it in our space, which tends to be a little different than a lot of the more commercial spaces. So, and primarily we're here because we want to be able, we want to share some of the approaches we've taken. We want you guys to be able to, to learn from some of our missteps, landmines, etc. But we also want to, to learn from you guys, find out what sort of stuff you guys have been doing to kind of advance your cybersecurity missions. So some baseline assumptions. We assume that you're all here because you're interested in building test labs and figuring out how to break tools, how to make them work better that you're interested in you know, catching bad guys and you have some at least, at least some base understanding of network security monitoring principles. Good reference for that would be Baitlick's book, uh, the Tau Network Security Monitoring. There's a very good set of principles outlined in there. He's got a couple other books that are really good too. But ultimately, you guys care about network security, so so do we. It's our, our livelihoods and our hobbies. So. Our expectations for you, we'll set those down. You can understand what we're going to do, what we're not going to do here. So we're not going to tell you what you need to do or what you tests you need to perform to evaluate products. Those are going to be very specific to your environments, your use cases, and to your specific problem sets that you're trying to address. We'll provide you some guidance on how to identify those and, and flesh those out for your specific organizational needs. We'll decide, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll de describe some guidelines for how to set up a test environment, some of the tools you're going to need, some of the dependencies, uh, some of the skill sets you're going to need to develop to execute these tests in a repeatable and effective manner. We do expect that you will practice safe testing. So, 
covered some of the topics here. There's a number of reasons why you are going to be evaluating security products. My favorite's at the bottom. There's always performance issues with pretty much every tool that's out there. And most tools do not provide you any sort of insight into how a new analysis process or a signature or rule or detection methodology will impact the performance of that platform. So you're kind of on your own dime there to figure that out and to kind of control your destiny when you're you know, taking some, you know, all your latest threat feeds from 300 different vendors and pushing them to your sensors. You need to know how your sensors are going to maintain operations and keep your SOC you know, filled with uh, useful data. Sometimes you have to have a new capability. You know, it's a lot of businesses approach cybersecurity from a compliance perspective, so you basically are meeting a SOX compliance rule or a PCI compliance rule, other government mandates. Some of them have no real basis in security. They're just somebody decided it was important for their business. So you need to define capabilities to meet those requirements. The latest trend, as I mentioned in the keynote earlier, endpoint security. It's the latest, greatest set of tools, right? But yeah, my favorite one is, you know, your boss goes to cyber security conference or any sort of conference, comes back with a bunch of great ideas and you're on the hook to figure out how to make them work. Right? So. This is a, a fun little quote we, we use here to uh, kind of justify playing. We built, we built a lab to test a lot of stuff, but ultimately we built it to, to play around with a lot of different toys and you know, play with all the fun stuff. So yeah, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. All right, so before you start building a lab, you got to have some sort of idea of what you're trying to accomplish. And with my background in software development, I've come from a, a very you know, well-defined process for testing and evaluating capabilities. You know, usually a crossover with quality assurance, ultimately a test plan, you know, mapped to some sort of requirements. So, but the challenge is when you're looking at new products that you didn't even know you needed until the vendor walked in your door. You know, you have to kind of develop those requirements and see if they're legitimate for your needs. The best way to do that is to roll them into a test plan. Understand what sort of objectives you, you want to test or, or achieve with those new platforms, new tools. And ultimately, you want to make sure that you perform all of your test activities in a very concise, repeatable fashion so that you have, can have some level of confidence in your test results. Because historically, <laughs> my experiences with a lot of the guys we have in our cybersecurity engineering team, uh, they're always chasing the latest cool thing that popped up on their screen. So they start down a path, they run, executing a bunch of tests, run into some obstacle and then pivot to something else, else that shows up or they run down that rabbit hole and next thing you know they're trying all kinds of new configuration changes and your whole entire test set, your results have just completely gone on vacation. You know, they, they, there's no basis for interpreting them at the end of the process. So the sharper you can define those test cases, uh, the more boundaries you can put around the execution plan of those test cases uh, will help you in the long term interpreting those result sets. You also do not want to completely overwhelm yourself with trying to test everything all at once. You can have multiple iterations of a test plan that focus on specific functional areas so that you're not trying to test things that may be stepping on each other. And the more, the more points you have to test in your test plan, uh, the more work you're going to have to do to analyze all that data in the back end. So while you may start off with the idea of testing you know, X, Y, and Z, if you test A through Z, before you can get any determination on your X, Y, Z, you have to test all that other stuff, which 
may ultimately, usually is not going to inform your decision at the end. Right. Yeah, find meaning. So the main point here is to look at your organizational needs, figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish with a particular product, define some metrics that will let you collect information that help inform your decision about viability for that product. There's you know, metrics, you Google metrics all you want, there's all kinds of stuff. Different metrics mean different things on different platforms. Packet loss is a big one that shows up in a lot of security analysis products. Throughput, packets per second, bandwidth, you know, monitored segments. You really need to figure out which ones are the most applicable to you and focus on those. Because once you figure out what those, what those important metrics are, you then have to figure out how to, how to inspect for them, how to monitor them. You know, how to instrument your tests to collect information about those metrics or what those metrics really mean. Because just a metric on a page is just a number. You have to understand what that number means. You have to you know, be able to communicate that meaning to your peers, your management, your staff, and let them understand why it's important. Oh yes, scope and requirements, my favorite topic. We have this conversation on a weekly basis. Because the tendency is to run down the rabbit hole, to pull the thread, figure out what, where it takes you. But ultimately that is counterproductive to executing your test. It's perfectly acceptable to make notes, to come back and look and investigate those issues or those topics, but do it outside of a particular test. We treat our testing process very much like an agile software development model. We schedule sprints that are, identify what topics we're going to test during a particular period of time, usually two to three weeks. Roll that test plan that fits that cycle. If we have to test more than fit than what we can execute in two to three weeks, that's more than one test plan ultimately. And then we can prioritize the results of the different test plans merge those results, analyze them, you know, at the back end of all of this. You, I, ultimately, you're going to want your high priority stuff first, though. You're going to want to, you know, use a fail fast approach. So defining that scope is, you know, number one. You also need to understand what type of environment from a, a network perspective, what kind of operational load these systems are going to be under, how many st staff are going to be maintaining them, because those all need to factor into you know, your test criteria. I've yet to see a commercial or open source product that behaves exactly how they advertise it. Maybe that's just because we tend to implement it a little bit, you know, deeper than the, than the, their, their target audience. But ultimately, there are thresholds which those devices stop performing correctly. So failure is imminent. It's going to happen. You need to define what your minimum acceptable level of threshold is for any of those performance metrics. Ideally, it's going to be you know, beyond what your current operating capability is. The other part of that is you don't want your, your security team to be, you know, running around looking at a bunch of different tools constantly. You want them to be able to focus their investigations. You know, the market likes to use the term single pane of glass. Every vendor sells you a single pane of glass. But when you buy 30 single panes of glass, you have 30 panes of glass. So the integration piece is key. You need to identify what the interoperability requirements are within your environment. Usually the standard way that is handled is blogging, syslog, other things. There are commercial products. We can talk about that later. Uh, API integration, 
So RESTful APIs, SOAP APIs. Anybody still doing SOAP? You probably don't want to talk to them. Too complicated. Orchestration's key, is it? When we say orchestration, what we're talking about is automation. So there's, there's a lot of tools out there right now touting the orchestration. Item. So you've got Puppet, Chef, Salt, Ansible. Those are all around you know, automating system deployment, system configuration. There's also orchestration tools around incident response, which is about retrieving information from tools. Those are all very important topics. But when you are defining those, focus on which side of that you're on. For us, the right now, our, you know, our immediate needs are more along the lines of system administration stuff, integrating, making sure that when we push rules out the systems, they actually get loaded. The systems actually ingest them and report errors and you know, their operating status. We need to patch. We don't want it to take three months. We want patching to be you know, a normal everyday operating process. So orchestration is key to a lot of that. Oh uh, yes. This is this is an area where our team went around and around a little bit because we were trying to develop an approach that lets us repeatedly test products or do you know, set up the test so that we can easily get new equipment in and out without having to completely re rebuild the infrastructure. Because you know, testing had always been an ad hoc thing. It was always a, oh yeah, we got to do this. It's very responsive. So we pull a few guys aside, set up a couple systems to generate, you know, 20 gigs of data flow. Different people were doing it every time. It was inconsistent. So what we did is we developed a testing methodology, which basically encapsulates how we go about executing tests. It's not the test plan. This is about it's kind of like a lifestyle, really, because it's it's about starting small, scaling up to at the, in that think unit tests for software developers. Anybody who's got that background, it's about testing concise things, and then scaling those, and then incorporating more complexity. James will talk more detail about that later, but it's really about you know developing a process to execute tests, a process to collect test results and data, and analyze those test results and, and report on those. Because ultimately, we need to have a report that comes out the end that influences a, either a buying decision or a building decision. And then we need to have a standard way of communicating that information. So that's developing that methodology is probably, we spent you know, three or four months after spending a few years testing products, developing that methodology. But now that we have that methodology developed, now we just focus on test results. All right. So finding the weaknesses and strengths of products. This is what we like doing. This is why we get out of bed. We like crushing the dreams of vendors. We like sending sales and marketing guys crying because they all claim in, they all come in claiming to do everything they want, you know, next-gen firewall. Who here knows everything a next-gen firewall is supposed to do? What makes it next-gen? Is it the same team that manages your current firewall is now going to be managing your firewall and your IPS devices? That usually doesn't work. The marketing team says it's you know, one person does everything. Standardize on your firewall. But the reality is, once you start pushing IPS rules on your firewall, the first thing that goes down is performance. So, you got to figure out what types of functions work well on those products, which ones don't. Separate the fact from the fiction. So we found several devices that they both very high performance throughput metrics. And it turns out that those throughput metrics are based on pure packet throughput. There's no analysis going on. So 
we can talk and we get to our pitfalls later. We can tell you some specific cases that were really fun to, to fight with. But we found a lot of areas where certain sensors work really well with certain types of detection and analysis rules, while the vast majority of the ones we used they just didn't work at all. We spent a year and a half fighting with vendors over product claims. So that's that's kind of what fueled this whole process we instantiated, developed this test lab, the test methodology, so that we can pick those battles with the vendors that sell us stuff and we have you know, a strong basis for making our claims without lawsuits. Yeah, so performance testing, that's my, that's a fun topic for me because there is the raw performance te testing, which you see those metrics all over the place. They're on Gartner, Forrester, you know, this device will do 14 and a half million packets per second, sustained. What they don't tell you is, you know, that all those packets are the same size, and it's usually a small size. They don't tell you, you know, what types of validations are in place for those packet counts. They don't tell you what else the box is doing. Well, it's, it's usually just doing passing packets. So what we tend to focus on is, you know, what we're referring to as weighted performance metrics. We want to know how a particular device performs while handling 20 gigs of throughput with, you know, IP-based signature rules loaded on it, flow rules, you know, other types of you know, detection rules, because those are the those are the normal operating conditions for our, our system. So, we can if we buy that fourteen and a half million packets per second box, put it on our network connection, to monitor a three gig connection, we expect it to do really well. Most cases, they don't. So one of the biggest challenges we had when standing up our test lab was kind of wrapping our heads around all the different types of tools that we needed to build this lab. And along with all of those tools came a lot of skills that had to be developed. We also had to have people in that tool box. It took us a little while. We came up with a pretty good set. We, we started testing and realized, hey, we didn't really understand how these tools work. So we stopped and started again. So we're going to cover a couple areas where uh, we feel are you know, the most instrumental parts of having a test lab for these product evaluations. But before we do, I do want to stress, make sure you're proficient with your tools. Yeah, you can gain some proficiency while you're building out your test mm -hmm. cases, uh, but when it actually comes time to executing your tests, uh, you need to make sure you understand what your tool is actually doing and know how to make it do what it needs to do, because your lack of proficiency in a tool can actually skew your test results. So you will not end up with the shiny new great product that you wanted at the beginning. So take the time, invest in yourselves and your team to develop those skill sets. Because you're going to have to you know, build those, implement those test cases, execute those test cases, tune those test cases, troubleshoot those test cases, because there's a lot of failures in this. There's failures at every level. So you need to be able to figure out which part of that process is causing the problem. Yeah, and, and the last bullet here is uh, before you build any basis of credibility on your, your test results, you need to make sure that the tests are doing what you think they're doing. They're working the way you want them to work. Because you, you're, otherwise you'll build the whole decision on a fallacy. All right, so here's the high-level list of tools, sets. 
So we start off with test orchestration. This can be a number of different things. There's also a traffic generation piece, your data acquisition and analytics, and a whole myriad of equipment you're going to need to have access to. So the next we'll talk about test orchestration. So this, this can be as simple as scripting, bash scripts, Perl scripts, shell scripts, PowerShell scripts, if you're of that like. Uh, Python's very popular. There are also a lot of commercial tools out there. The main point here that we're talking about on this test orchestration though is you need to be able to coordinate all of the layers of your test process at the same time. So if you write a script to execute your test plan or a single test case, you're going to want to generate some log data that says, hey, this test XYZ has, was initiated at this specific time and here's the label. And then all of your instrumentation points along your test lab will be also feeding data back. So th this will make your correlation a lot easier at the end. If there's an error, you know, get that log. And then you can actually see the impact across your test lab when that error occurs. And then when the test is done, this is the key, this is another key part. You can log the stop, but you can also clean up your mess. Because you don't want, you know, debris from your previous test case distorting your next test case. It's also very helpful when you have more than one person doing the testing to use this approach because then you can queue up these test requests. You can execute a lot of stuff in parallel. As long as you have enough artifacts to correlate at the end, you're in pretty good shape. There are commercial orchestration tools out there. Most of them center around quality assurance tools. I won't get into specific brands. Follow up here with a microphone being recorded. But we can talk about it later if you want. Traffic generation. This is one area we struggled with a lot. <clears throat> the vast majority of our networks that we monitor are you know, sub one gigabit. But we have a lot of customers that are in the 10, 40, 100, 800 gigabit range. You cannot just assume that your traffic generation methodologies for 1 gig and 10 gig will yield similar results at 100 gig, 800 gig, and beyond. You can also not assume that any of your test cases will scale linearly as well. So if you get a monitor an 800 gigabit connection, you need to be able to generate 800 gigabits of data. And that is not a small feat. So those tools need to be reliable. You need to know exactly what it's doing. What the, you need to be able to control the flow of data. You need it to execute in the same manner every time you execute it. Ultimately, you don't want your generation issues to skew your test results at the end of this run. It does require, require specialized knowledge, how to maximize your traffic generation. Especially if you go with commercial products, you need to learn how to use them. It's even more so on the open source stuff because there's not a lot of documentation out there that's available. So the... the the last two bullets here are, are what I consider vital on the traffic generation stuff. It's one thing to generate traffic data or generate traffic for analysis that is a random PCAP or a PCAP with a specific threat in it. The problem is with that approach is a lot of the newer products will see that traffic coming across the wire and say, hey, I don't like the timestamp on that. Hey, this isn't a real conversation. I'm going to ignore it. So you're not going to get you know, a positive result where you think you should. This is a problem we had with several commercial products, security products, because it would recognize that, hey, this is a simulated conversation. This isn't a real thing. It's not worth my time. I'm just going to drop it and move on. The other side of that is very rarely do your, are these sensors going to operate in a world where you only have bad stuff in the network. They operate in enterprise networks, small business networks, internet connections. So you need to be able to generate a lot of that noise 
which is you know, anything from mail traffic, you know, uh, Pandora's big streaming videos, streaming data, YouTube. You need to be able to generate all that kind of content and then be able to inject specific threats, live threats into that space so that the device knows it's live and actually analyzes the data. And then you can actually see how it responds to real data. Sample data gets you halfway there, but the final leg, you're going to have to use real live malware to do this analysis. Which is why we're talking about safe testing. You know, don't do this on your production network. If you can, that'd be great. Give us a call, we'll help you out. So, there's a couple of different open source traffic generators we've used. TC re TCP replay, that's the default standard for everybody. This is the one we ran into a lot of problems with because consistency issues, it wasn't real data, it wasn't, wasn't providing real you know, client server conversations. Scapey, it's another one. Ostinato. Ostinato is a really cool tool. It takes a little while to figure out how to use it. It's, and it actually, it's a client server setup, so you actually got a master server and a bunch of traffic drones or virtual machines running out on your network. It will say, generate this type of traffic, and it will actually create traffic flows between those clients and servers. Again, commercial traffic generators here. Uh, we use one. We love it. Uh, again, I'm not going to endorse them in this form, but talk to me afterwards and I give you all kinds of information. All right. Yeah, data acquisition. This is this one's a big one to handle. You, you're going to be generating a lot of data from a lot of different points. You need to have a reliable ingestion pipeline, and you need to have some pretty significant performance on the back end indexing all that data so you can actually search and analyze the results. Yeah. It's typically, you know, you, you have a set of log borders you put out everywhere. Syslog is the main one everybody uses. Logstash is pretty popular these days as well. Everybody knows the leading commercial reporting tools there. Talk about that later too. So not everything that you're going to want to inspect or pull data from is going to be able to forward log data. And it also may not give you the level of granularity you want on that platform. So being able to integrate with web services, RESTful web services, SOAP web services, lets you pull or push data you know, from those places, lets you tie in you know, metric performance metrics at many steps of the process and also let you have a positive control over that communication process. So that you, that can also tie into your orchestration piece so that you know every 30 seconds I'm doing a memory snapshot on the machine. Trigger that via an API, suck it all back for correlation. The Elk Stack is a great open source uh, log and analysis platform. It handles your Indexing, which is solar for indexing, Elasticsearch, solar. Has a pretty interface implemented with Kibana, Logstash. It's rival. See the back of my jacket. It's a, it's a very powerful tool. Requires a good bit of knowledge to have it performing well at a high level. You need to know how to tune your indexers. You need to know how to tune your search queries. You need to be able to generate the analysis reports, correlate the data. And you need, it's almost a full-time job to manage that stack. So you need to have, you know, the expertise to ensure the quality of that ingestion pipeline and the analysis that comes out of it. So this is just a high level equipment list of various things that you're going to need in your lab. You're going to need servers. These are going to either be you know, standalone servers running your, your whatever OS of the week or the hypervisors to run VMs, uh, a lot of different varieties. Basically, you're going to want to replicate whatever your operational environment 
if you've got VMware as your primary you know, OS stack, that's what you're going to want in your test lab. VMware also, you know, lets you gives you gives you some flexibility of virtual appliances. There are a lot of virtualization platforms, but almost every security product out there ships VMware OVAs that you can use for testing. If you get into other products like KVM and uh, you know, the other you know, virtualization platforms, you have to go through a conversion process to get those appliances loaded in your test environment. You're going to need a set of network switches. Most is mostly to ensure you know, your management network for access to those test, test components, your log delivery, and you know, your data acquisition network to suck all that data off the sensors and the uh, devices under test, and your traffic generation platforms. Uh, we use a 10 gig network for that. Not everybody needs to, though. We just we're testing high bandwidth stuff, so you know, if you run Bro. 20, 10, 20 gigs of data in a bro sensor with everything turned on, you're gonna you're gonna want a 40 gig connection probably. Taps, spans, whatever you're using in your in your production network. If you're using taps to monitor your network segments, use taps in your lab. If you're using spans, use spans in your lab. Using both, use both. Because you're, this needs to be basically be a scale model of your production environment, whatever you're monitoring, whatever you're securing. You want scale representation. The packet broker piece is essential if you're testing more than one product concurrently. If you're doing one test at a time or one device at a time, not a big deal. It does give you a little bit more visibility into the traffic as it goes into the sensor and comes out of the sensors, lets you slice and dice some of that traffic. But what we primarily use it for is replicating test data to a set of devices that are under test concurrently. So what they may be the same product, two instances, three instances of the same product, so that you have a basis of comparison to see deviations across that same stack, or they could be competitors. Ultimately, this is a force multiplier for us. So, if we we're evaluating 12 devices, we can iterate through three iterations of a test versus 12. One second. I forgot how dry it was up here. And the last thing is cables and SFPs, single mode SSPs, multi mode SFPs. If those are the environments you're operating in, have those components. A lot of people wonder, you know, well, it doesn't really matter what type of cable it is, what type of media it is, but ultimately the devices that those plug into are different. So just make sure you have a variety to support whatever you're going to be doing. Once again, key considerations. Isolate this test lab from your production system your lives will be much easier. And the best thing about it is you don't have to deal with a bunch of grumpy sysadmins when you need to make small changes. You can pivot as you need to. You're not tied to the same configuration management process that your production network is tied to. You can run the live malware on there. You can blow away the whole thing and rebuild it if you want. But you need to be able to support the same protocols, media types, and network speeds that are you have in your production environment. I'll reiterate that over and over and over. Software developer nature, sorry. But yeah, you do need to understand the constraints of that lab. You do need to understand that you know your logging infrastructure may be only set up to handle you know two terabytes of data in just a day, five hundred gigabytes of data in just a day. You need, it doesn't do you any good to test beyond that because you'll spend all your time waiting. There's an example where we ran a test on a bro sensor. It took five minutes to execute the test. It took 15 hours to ingest all the data. That was a problem. A learning problem. So. Sure. I'll hand it over to James. He can talk about that. So good afternoon, James. Um, so, you know, as we have audio. Okay, we do. Perfect. 
So, you know, as Tilly was saying, first Tilly, that is, um, you know, you know, our approach was, you know, starting with small tests, you know, and sort of incrementing up, you know, building as we go. Um, uh, so, you know, when we first started, we were, had an ad hoc approach, and, you know, we are just executing a test on a single device, um, you know, with a single, you know, packet generation. Um, and then we just sort of assembled and took that and said, okay, well, you know, we need to, you know, mature this as a, as a process, you know, as we built out our test lab. Um, you know, as he was saying, you know, you know, we're using 10 gig, but, you know, this approach can scale to the size of your organization and, you know, your needs, right? So, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, it doesn't have to be hundred thousand dollars. You know, it can fit to whatever your approach is. Um, so here we have, you know, sort of a high-level diagram, sort of displaying, you know, how data flows through the system, right? So, you know, we have the test or orchestration piece, you know, sort of, you know, kicking everything off, you know, um, you know, and then we have the two hypervisors with the VMs passing traffic through from one to the other. You know, and in the middle we've implemented a tap which is sending data to the, to the broker and the broker is then, you know, sending data to the devices under test. And then the data from, you know, the packet generation, the broker, the devices under test, all that feeds up to your log correlation. <clears throat> so and then, you know, at the log at the log correlation, you know, we're having you know, it's getting indexed, and then on top of that, the analysis and the reporting, and you know, sort of building those artifacts. Uh, yeah. Um, the instrumenting of the packet broker, uh, you know, sort of the our approach here is, you know, every Every step of the way the packet is going, you know, uh, needs to be instrumented. That way you can sort of, at, you know, if something goes sideways, you see where it went sideways. Um, now with this, with this diagram here, all we're trying to illustrate is um, if you're testing an inline solution, right? This is this would be sort of how you would do that, right? So um, all the devices under test, um, they're using the packet broker as a, the inline traffic, right? So as the traffic passes through the device under test, it can drop or however it's going to do that, you know, if it sends a reset or what have you. Um, All right, data collection. Um, so, you know, one of the points we want to talk about is, you know, the time synchronization. So, um, all the devices need to be, you know, with, you know, time synced, whether you're using NTP or what have you. Um, that way, there's no discrepancies. Because if you get discrepancies time-wise, that, that can really throw you for a loop and it will take hours and hours to figure out, okay, why why did packet A not get to where it was supposed to be? Well, it was actually, you know, it was, you know, the logs we're looking at are not actually the correct logs. So that's the critical piece there. Um, the B, so as Chris was saying, you know, you can generate a significant amount of data, and so you need to scale appropriately. Um, you know, and that can be challenging because, you know, with products, you may not know uh, what that is, you know, so you need to talk to the vendor or, you know, peers as well. It can be a useful resource for trying to figure out how to scale your logging infrastructure. <clears throat> um, you know, and then, you know, so we, we've made a couple mistakes, 
in this process, which has sort of informed our, our decision making. Um, and that's, so like with the logging infrastructure, right? So, you know, it can lead to misleading results if you are expecting that, you know, all your event data that's been being generated is coming in right after the test. Um, and think of at least a couple scenarios where it was like, okay, you know, we thought that the device was performing under our limits, but it was actually, you know, all our infrastructure around it that was causing the issues. So, you know, just considerations. Analytics and reporting. Um, so, you want to validate your test assumptions, right? So, um, this sort of goes with the fail fast approach, right? So if, you know, I say, hey, this IDS expect it to do X, Y, and Z, well, you know, design tests around X, Y, Z and try to break that assumption. And if it, you know, if you validate, okay, it works, well, cool, you know what I mean? But, you know, if it fails, you know, that's a, that's a data point that you can then use to engage with the conversation with the vendor or whoever, right, to see, you know, see what that narrative looks like. <clears throat> Interpreting the data, right? So, um, you know, data is just numbers, right? So, if you, if you don't do anything to, you know, build these artifacts and sort of build a narrative around them, you know, it's really meaningless. So you have to, you have to build that narrative and say, you know, hey, we tested X and, you know, it, it ran really poorly in these scenarios. But the reason that was is because, you know, X, Y, or Z, you know, we, we undertuned or we overtuned or what have you. So, you know, just capturing the narrative is important for, you know, sort of building that, that knowledge base. So use peers to validate conclusions, right? So, um, you know, if if during your testing you're making configuration changes and you say, you know, we made this change and we think this is going to make it perform better because of these reasons, you know, validate that with the team. Say, hey, you know, I think this. And they'll say, you know, yeah, that makes sense to us. Let's, let's do that. Um, and then, you know, uh, they'll, you know, you can just build a consensus and, you know, sort of smoke check your conclusions. Uh, so visualization of the, the data that's coming out of this, right? You know, it's helpful. You know, graphs are pretty. Everybody likes graphs. Uh, don't go overboard. Um, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to really speak more to it than that. You know, just don't go crazy with it. <coughs> And then finally, you know, pressing the big red button, hitting go, sending packets, executing on your test plan. Um, you know, find the limits of the system, break it, you know, and then break it again. And, you know, the, you know, that's a data point, like I said earlier. You know, when you see where the limits are of the system, you can sort of define the normal operating boundaries, right? And then additionally, you can define, you know, sort of the out of normal boundaries as well, you know? What happens if all the traffic's fragmented? Or what happens if all the traffic is, you know, segmented or what have you? So, and then as you do that, then you scale it back to, you know, your normal operating procedures and see how it performs there. <clears throat> so details matter, right? So as you're doing this, you want to be generating artifacts about what you're doing, you know, and you know, the framework that you've developed should help you with that, the logging infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, just document stuff. You know, I executed this test at this time. These were the results, and the, or, you know, it failed because of these reasons. Then, on top of that, you know, monitor the tests and the components. Ensure test components are doing as expected. Um, and then if you do have errors, investigate those errors. You know, try to do some root cause analysis. Um, you know, sometimes that's always not successful. You know, sometimes, you know, the vendor has the black box and they're not going to tell you how the box ticks. But, you know, 
sometimes that will pro provide you know further points with which you can you know use this data. And then you know uh, just to iterate, you know, keep testing uh, and building that sort of repository of knowledge. You know, you you basically are familiarizing yourself with the product. Um, and these tests just give you a quantifiable, measured way to, in which to do that. And then as you iterate, you know, tweak, tune, make, you know, because some of your assumptions might be faulty, right? Like, we expected it would do this, and that wasn't the case. So let's redesign the test to meet the valid conditions in which this will operate. Um, so, and this, and this process takes time, right? So, you know, you're going to have to, this goes back to, the, you know, the scoping and requirements, you know. So you need to sort of set expectations and be like, okay, this is, this is what it's going to take to, you know, test and build that repository of knowledge to make a correct product selection. You know, we could take the easy way and, you know, just say vendor A. But, you know, we're trying to quantify what that looks like, so. And a uh, quote from Adam Savage here, because he's pretty cool. So, you know, the only difference between screwing around and science is writing it down. So, you know, document, document, and document. And I think, huh? Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much it, unless oh, we're done for time. we got a few minutes. Okay. Oh, the next one starts at 2.30. Okay. So, yeah, so if anyone has any questions right now, what I guess would be the time to uh, sort of let them fly. Yep, go ahead. So that's an excellent question. Um, he asked, the tools and the methodologies that we built, is that gonna be publicly available? Um, I think Chris has mentioned, we won't really talk about like commercial tools just because we don't wanna influence anyone, but what we, we um, I think we were planning on releasing the slides and maybe the framework. So yeah, we had, we had a few instances where people were threatening some lawsuits about endorsements and stuff, so. We can talk to you individually and kind of give you that information. More than happy to do so. You can also, we've got our contact information, I think, on the next slide. Uh, we'll be releasing the slide deck and, and along with our speaking notes, which have more details as well. But you can also reach out to us and we can have that dialogue and give you more specifics about what exactly we're using. We just don't want to provide any sort of, you know, free endorsement in a recorded form. So. Yeah, this is our, we both have Twitter accounts, we both have emails, you can reach out to us anytime, talk to us afterwards, we can give you the whole rundown. We talk about this setup to a lot of different people on a regular basis, so we like talking, we like to know what you guys are using as well. Anything else? That's it? All right, thanks for coming. We, we came up from Las Vegas. I don't think we got that out to you guys. We're from Las Vegas, so we came up here just to hang out with you guys. So hope it's, hope it's a fun conference.